Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I'm your host, the Wilder historian, Dr. Lucas Wilder. And last time, Washington got married and moved his new family to Mount Vernon. Now we see what he's doing as a planner in Northern Virginia. Please consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already. Join the Patreon page or purchase something from the Teespring store or Etsy shop. Every little bit helps. Thank you. After becoming the initial surveyor for the 200,000 acres of land for the possible new colony in the Ohio River Valley, Washington set off on a nine-week journey into the backcountry and traveled over 1,100 miles. He ran no surveys. He simply took notes and marked the corners of the proposed soldier's land. When he returned, he got his friend William Crawford the job as the surveyor who would divide the land between the soldiers and the officers. While Crawford did that, Washington visited with many of the veterans and persuaded them to sell him their land, because he told them it was either too hilly or there would be little likelihood that they would even get the land in the end anyway. After speaking to the veterans, he obtained about 5,100 acres. Washington then met with the Virginia government to discuss land divisions, proposing that he himself get the best land. He said as much to a friend, saying that why shouldn't he get the best land, because he was the reason anyone was getting the land in the first place. In the end, Washington received over 20,000 acres of land, some of the best in the whole allotment. At least one former officer complained about the lack of good land in his own tract. Washington wrote back a scathing letter saying, As I am not accustomed to receive such from any man, nor would have taken the same language from you personally without letting you feel some marks of my resentment, I would advise you to be cautious in writing me a second of the same tenor, for though I understand you were drunk when you did it, Yet give me leave to tell you that drunkenness is no excuse for rudeness, and that but for your stupidity and sottishness you might have known by attending to the public gazettes that you had your full quantity of 10,000 acres of land allowed you. When Washington's friend, who was the surveyor, was found out to not have properly taken the oaths required of a surveyor, the governor disallowed the measurements laid out. However, he would eventually get the land after the American Revolution began, when Virginia's government validated the survey. Washington lived lavishly at Mount Vernon. He purchased large quantities of rum and wine. He preferred Madeira. Through his overseas purchasing agents, he obtained food that was not common in North America, including special cheeses, nuts, spices, candies, and other delicacies. Within 10 years, he purchased about 24 pairs of expensive shoes. His wardrobe was immense, but nothing like Martha's. Most of the wardrobe purchased by Washington was for Martha. As a man of the period, he enjoyed horse and boat racing. Exotic animals intrigued him. He paid to see a tiger and a lion. He arranged to have an elk brought to the estate and tried without success to get bison for his pastures. As a planner in colonial Virginia, it was a social obligation to entertain guests, and that on a nearly constant basis in one form or another. That was one reason he stocked hundreds of gallons of wine and whiskey at his home. He and his guests would play cards, backgammon, and billiards amidst talking politics, agriculture, and gossip. He often visited the Masonic Lodge Hall, where he had become a member in 1753, quickly rising to Master Mason. He and Martha would slip away on vacations to Berkeley Springs, where the warm mineral waters were used as a place of healing. At one point, he stayed almost six weeks in a cottage there. One of his favorite things to do was hunt. Hunting provided him with immense relaxation, and he tried to do it at least ten full days a month sometimes more. He used his hounds to hunt pheasant, duck, deer, and foxes. He also loved to raise dogs, breeding his best stock to obtain some of the best hunters. Horrifically, he would kill the pups if they weren't of proper pedigree. He wasn't a fan of leisure reading. Most of his books were either of an agricultural nature or military manuals or biographies. He didn't collect art pieces. His furniture was for functionality rather than style. He didn't like attending church, only doing so about once a month. When he did go, he didn't partake in the Eucharist. As one of his biographers stated, he was not a deist, however. He believed in God's intervention in worldly affairs, and he anticipated a life after death. He didn't like visiting his mother either. Apparently, she was too domineering. In 1771, he and his brothers convinced her that she would be more comfortable elsewhere than at Ferry Farm. She negotiated a deal with George that she would live in one of his houses in Fredericksburg, and he would provide her with the necessities of life 
while also paying her an annual rent for Ferry Farm. When Mary Washington moved to Fredericksburg, Washington sold Ferry Farm for 2,000 pounds. Two of the most frequent visitors to Mount Vernon were George William Fairfax and his wife Sally Fairfax. Washington and Martha would regularly stay the night at Belvoir, and likewise George William and Sally would spend the night at Mount Vernon. The two men hunted together and Martha grew close to Sally through their frequent visits, so much so that they would become friends. In the early 1770s, Sally would fall ill and her and George William would sail to England for her medical treatment. They would never return to Virginia. By the time they thought they could return, the Revolutionary War was underway and George William would side with the Crown. Many years later, after George William's death, Washington would write to Sally for the last time, telling her that he often looked at Belvoir and thought of her, and that his happiest moments in his life were in her company. It's most likely that he still had affection for and loved Sally, no matter how long he had been married to Martha. His marriage to Martha had been one of convenience, but he grew to love her. He would say later that love was too fragile of a foundation on which to build a marriage, better it be built upon good sense and good dispositions. Washington treated Martha's children from her first marriage as if they were his own. Washington wanted to have children of his own, but by the early 1770s, both he and Martha realized that that was not a possibility. John Park Custis, or Jackie to his family, was a spoiled child before Washington married his mother. The boy's actions exasperated his stepfather, but Washington spared no expense raising the child. He got him the best tutors, and by the age of 15, he sent him to study with the Anglican clergyman, Jonathan Boucher, in Maryland. Because he stood to inherit a great wealth when he came of age, Jackie didn't care for studying. Boucher stated that Jackie was the most indolent and hedonistic person he had ever known, and that his actions reflected more of an Asiatic prince than a scholar. When he turned 18, Jackie would be sent to King's College in New York, but before he left, he informed George and Martha that he was getting married. Both parents balked at their son not consulting them and throwing away his education. Plus, the young woman, Eleanor Calvert, named Nellie by her friends, wasn't of the same status as the Washingtons. The parents convinced Jackie to attend college and postpone the marriage, but after six months, Jackie dropped out of school to marry Nellie. Patsy, the daughter of Martha, was also treated as one of Washington's own children. They bought her the best dolls to play with, got her music lessons, and she lived a comfortable life, but the young lady began to have epileptic seizures. Washington brought in multiple doctors to help cure or relieve Patsy of the ailment, but nothing was working. She suffered with seizures for five years before finally succumbing to the illness on June 19, 1773, when she was just 15 years old. Washington and Martha stayed secluded at Mount Vernon, Washington not leaving the estate for three months. The two grieving parents took long carriage rides together with no destination to grieve together in solitude. In September 1773, Washington left Mount Vernon for the first time since Patsy's death to attend a horse race. Afterward, legal matters had to be taken care of. Patsy's inheritance was dealt with. Half went to her brother and the other half to Washington. Washington used Patsy's land to pay off his debts.